Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Brash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. I'm going to be in Milwaukee on Saturday. Would love a chance to shake your hand. I'm going to be out there invited by the Milwaukee Humanists. It's a special benefit called the Brew City Benefit. Uh, Alex Jules is going to be there, Aaron Raw, Callie Wright, so many others. Uh, and it's a very special day. We all just hang out, and the proceeds are going to support the victims of rape and sexual assault, specifically the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, also known as RAIN. I can't wait. It's going to be such a good day. If you can't attend in Milwaukee, you can still support it. I'll put the link with all the details and the donation links there as well in the description box of this show. But Milwaukee, Saturday, I will see you there, okay? So I was uh, scrolling social media a few weeks ago, and it's mostly the same kind of stuff. You know, when you and I log on to Facebook and Twitter, we'll see, oh, look, there's a fair share of political posts and here's somebody who said or did something outrageous and here's a a recipe and here's a cat video and here's you know funny gag and here's this and here's that and and you know you try to sift through all of the rubble to find the gems to find the stuff that makes it worthwhile to use social media but i saw something it just jumped out at me it was a meme that was posted by thomas westbrook he's better known as holy kool-aid out there And I reposted it, and it prompted a huge, long discussion on my page. And I just thought here, as we kick off the month of April, it might make for an interesting show. And so since I'm referencing Thomas, I figured I'd have Thomas join me here at the top of the show. Hey, Thomas, how's it going, brother? Fantastic. How are you? I'm good. Tell everybody what Holy Kool-Aid the channel is and does, would you? Holy Kool-Aid's a movement. It's a movement to promote curiosity. I think too many people are terrified to to ask certain questions and to doubt or think outside the box. And I think as long as we do it within a framework of uh, critical thinking and using scientific skepticism, curiosity is a good thing. And I want people to dare to be curious, but at the same time to not fall into cult-like ways of thinking, you know, to, to avoid drinking that Kool-Aid, so to speak. So you posted this meme on the internet and I shared it and we just got a bunch of great responses. But where did this come from, man? Well, so this was initially posted by Atheist Worldwide, which is it's a, a massive growing Facebook group. It has over 20,000 likes. And um, one of the the members, I'm an admin of the group. I can't actually take credit for the meme, though. But it's this this image of this screaming, you know, temper tantrum like child And it says, name some response that you hear a Christian use when they're losing an argument. You probably hear this quite a bit and have a few answers of your own to that question, right? Oh, yeah. Just about everyone in my family is religious. And, you know, I spent years in the Bible Belt. I was a missionary kid. So I've heard everything from you're taking that out of context to, you know, you just have to have faith and God will reveal himself to you. Is this just them running out of ideas? Well, I think there's only a limited number of responses, and we've heard them all. If there was a legitimate argument for you know these religious beliefs, then I would be willing. I would love to hear it, and I've I've been waiting on the edge of my seat for years now for an original response because all of the old ones have already been answered. You know, I've I've heard so many. You know, the cosmological argument I've I've heard a million times. You know, the the fine tuning argument. Each one of these come up again and again and again, and they've been debunked so many times. The one that gets me is, read this book. Yeah, like this one book will answer all your questions. I'm fascinated by the idea that the perfect book requires another human written book to clarify and explain it. I just never got that. 
instead of, hey, read the Bible, they're like, you need to, to take an exegetic look by delving into the work of this human apologist who will then explain what God is trying to say. And I think to myself, that makes no sense to me. Exactly. And I've used this comparison before, but I so I grew up in the Muslim world. And whether it's the Bible or the Quran, you always have someone who says – you need to have either you know a, a PhD in Islamic studies or in theology or philosophy or something in order to be able to actually understand it. You, you're just a layman. You, you can't grasp it. But my response to that is, well, hey, look, a newspaper editor knows that the average person, the layman, reads at maybe a ninth grade level, if that. And so they tailor their newspaper accordingly and they, they write in such a way that anyone can understand it. Now, you'd think that if God – who writes this perfect book tailored to mankind, if he's the omniscient, all-knowing God of the universe, you would think he would know that and tailor his holy book accordingly. And the Bible also turns around and tells us that the Lord works in mysterious ways while also declaring he's not the author of confusion. I mean, there's an apologetic for any scenario. We're going to run down some of the best ones our listeners have submitted. Real fast, tell everybody how to find you online. Thomas Westbrook. Most of my work is in very bite-sized, easy-to-consume cartoon format videos on Holy Kool-Aid, on the Holy Kool-Aid YouTube channel. You can find everything on my website, holykoolaid.com. And I'm actually in the process of launching a new podcast called The Here and How, which examines big ideas and, and scientific discoveries with two other YouTubers, Rachel Oates and Rationality Rules. So that's going to be fun. Well, good for you and best wishes on the new endeavor. Thanks for kicking off the show idea. Just a nice distraction for us, a chance to vent. And I'm sure our paths will cross here on the convention circuit real soon. Okay, my friend? Absolutely. Hey, Seth, thank you so much for all that you do. Come on, I'm sure you can already think of a bunch of examples. Name something a Christian says when they are losing an argument to an atheist. I mean, any of us who've been in these conversations know what it's like when you hear an argument, a claim, a position, and it's refuted. You provide them the evidence or resources where they can find the evidence. You counter with some reasonable piece of information, and then they blink and they move on to the next thing and the next thing until finally they sort of run out of ammo. Right? They've gone through the short list of apologetics that they carry with them, and they just start to vibrate. And then they say this. Well, my number one was... I'll pray for you. Now, this is something that can be done with sort of an attitude of compassion, rarely. But you'll see someone say, oh, I'm, I mean, I've seen people cry. I've had relatives, they'll cry. You know, I'm going to pray that Jesus will reveal himself to you in the way that he's revealed himself to me. And it just grieves me that you live without knowing Jesus personally in your heart that you're missing out on the joy that I feel. I mean, it's a genuine expression of emotion. She wasn't really trying to be condescending. She felt hugely grieved that I was not a believer in her Jesus. Most of the time, though, when I'm in a discussion and they say, I'll pray for you, this is you know, like a jab. I'm going to pray for you. You know what? I'll, and they're usually walking away. I'll pray for you. I'm praying for you. You need prayer, son. I'm going to lift you up in my prayers knowing that one day... You will come to your senses. That's how they say, I will pray for you. A close second was the response, well, one day you will see on the day of judgment, every knee is going to bow. Translated, you just wait till after you're dead, which is not really a position at all. It, wait till you're dead and it's too late for it to be proven to anyone else who is not dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one day when you die, and these come in various flavors. Some people say in an indignant, superior way, but still because they care, they say one day you'll see every knee will bow and one day you too will bow before Jesus and have to give account right on the day of judgment. And other people threaten you with it. You know, one day when you're burning in hell, when you're on fire and I'm up there in heaven, you're going to think of this conversation and wish that you would come to Jesus. So it's a threat, right? It's a threat. We lost the great Stephen Hawking last month. I mean, a very big loss of such a keen mind. You know, I tried to read A Brief History of Time, and it was so thick. So I actually 
I bought a briefer history of time, which is kind of a simplified version for people like me, for civilians, which allowed me to play along in Hawking's world. I would encourage you to do that because some other people said, I respect Hawking, but he made my brain explode. So a briefer history of time is uh, a great resource if you're looking for sort of a toe in the water. But uh, as soon as Stephen Hawking's death was announced, many Christians went public and just started saying that Stephen Hawking was an atheist in life, but he believes in God now. Some tweets that were posted by Michael Stone on the progressive secular humanist page at Patheos. Stephen Hawking is burning in hell. Funny, his final thoughts were that he was going to enter eternal darkness, but when he woke up, he found himself before the Lord, his soul judged by him to be tortured for all eternity in the realm of Satan. That was posted by a guy named Alexander. I'm sure posted in love. He was grieved in his spirit. A guy, oh my, his name is Magaloid Milf Man. Are you shitting me? Reminder that Stephen Hawking is burning in hell right now. Kobe says Stephen Hawking going to pull up hell and Satan going to be waiting for him like. There's a post by Westboro Baptist Church. This is not a surprise where they quoted Psalm 14.1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, right? Stephen Hawking, the brilliant man, was actually the fool because he did not believe in God. And they called him a foolish, corrupt, and abominable person. Well, we consider the source, right? More tweets. Stephen Hawking's burning in hell right now. He is in hell because he was a scientist? (laughs) What? What? How pathetic are these people? Instead of grieving the loss of a human brother, instead of feeling for his family and his friends and his fans and for those whose life had been positively impacted, instead of grieving the loss of a great mind, their first thought is, well, he's cooking now. He's down there screaming and wailing and crying out for a drop of water on the tip of his tongue, and yet there shall be none. He should have accepted Jesus when he had the chance. And the rest of you who think that we're being hateful, well, you'll just see when you're dead. Don't even begin to tell me that this flavor of judgmental, petty Christianity has some kind of a moral high ground. Don't even start. Well, the listeners joined in and they started to toss out some of the favorite responses that they have seen time and time again when they've had discussions with believers like Michael, who said, you know, I just don't understand how you don't believe in something bigger than yourself. I mean, look all around you. Who did all of these things? Where did it all come from? Christopher brought up the one where someone says, well, you know, it's my truth. It's true for me which supposedly immunizes them from challenge because a personal truth is now exclusively theirs and doesn't relate to anybody else. You know, it's true for me. It's my truth. I don't get this. Like gravity is not your truth, right? Gravity is not just your fact. Gravity is a fact. (laughs) You know, the planet spinning. This is not your truth. This is a fact. It's an observable, established, demonstrable fact. And so uh, you can't just retreat into, well, it's my truth. It's true for me, and therefore it is true with a capital T. Michelle said, you're taking it out of context, which is always fun when you're talking about things like slavery and slave torture in the Old Testament. You bring that up and you say, why would God ever condone and even command slavery, the buying and selling of human beings as property. Why in the world would that be okay? Well, he took it out of context. In the proper context, it makes total sense. Either that or it's indentured servanthood. Have you heard this one? So it's okay to beat. It's okay to torture your indentured servants so that they're unconscious for up to 48 hours. That's totally fine in the proper context. How about this one submitted by Joseph? Even if you don't believe in God, he believes in you. Which, in my opinion, is in the Hall of Fame of superior and condescending platitudes. You just have faith in science. I know because the Spirit is in me or the Lord is in my heart. I have a personal relationship. It's not religion, It's a relationship. You're criticizing religion. You're talking about a religion. I'm talking about a personal relationship with my Lord. People walking away, just 
turning 180 degrees and walking away from the fundamental texts of their own religion. <laughs> just, you know, the Bible is just, I don't, I don't get caught up in the Bible. I, I have a relationship with Jesus. Well, wait a minute. Where did we get Jesus? Well, we got him from the Bible. But I don't hold to all of that, all the details and things. You know, my Jesus does this. My Jesus acts like that. My Jesus has told me this. My Jesus has told me that. Everybody constructing their own Jesus, and all those Jesuses are arguing, essentially arguing with each other. This Jesus is a Jesus of judgment, and he's going to send you to hell. But no, this Jesus, my Jesus, would never send anyone to hell. My Jesus is a Jesus of love who wants everyone to come and be with him in heaven. My Jesus wants you to bow down and say the salvation prayer and repent and all these things. And my Jesus just wants you to be a good person in your heart. Jesus knows the heart. He won't judge anyone, send anyone to hell if you live a good life. The people have all these Jesus. Hell, on the outside, the Jesuses look different. You got white Jesus. Yeah, he was born in the Middle East. He's a white Jesus. There's Mexican Jesus. There's Asian Jesus. There's black Jesus. There's Jesuses of all shapes and stripes representing the cultures that are promoting them, and they all look different. Paul had another good one. Well, you need to respect people's beliefs. This is supposedly another conversation stopper. You know, you just need to respect people's beliefs. And I'm like, no, respect people, most people. I don't have to respect their beliefs. You believe the earth is flat? You think that's going to get respect? Not so much. You want to believe in a super baby who was born 2,000 years ago and nailed to a few pieces of wood to save the world from a problem that he himself created? Not so much. I mean, you think about Christians and you say, I think you should treat Islam with respect. Watch the look on their faces. Well, that's a lie. That's a false teaching. I don't respect Islam. Ask the Islamist if they respect Christianity or Mormonism or Scientology or something. I mean, these people don't respect each other's beliefs. What they're saying is, well, you have to respect my religion. I mean, there are a few people out there that put the coexist stickers on their cars. I don't like that sticker either. Because quite frankly, religion is designed, most religions, especially the monotheistic religions, they're not designed to coexist. Certainly Christianity and Islam, they're designed to be a great commission, to spread, to convert, to dominate. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go out, find people, preach the gospel, share the good news, make converts. Let's make the world a Christian world. We see right now Islam saying, let's make the world an Islamic world, often under the threat of pain or death. Test these requests for respect by the various religious people. You'll find out what they really want. They don't necessarily want all religions respected. They just want preferential treatment for their own. John posted something about uh, the worldview. Your worldview doesn't make any sense as an atheist. Where does this one come from? Like, atheism is not a worldview. The word worldview is actually, in many ways, used as a religious term. I mean, you'll find it used very often in the church. Uh, there's a, a college here, Oral Roberts University here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They have a class called Christian Worldview. Holy shit. They're going to tell you what your worldview is. I mean, there's so much. The title of the class itself is wrongheaded. All these little minnows go in there and these people tell them. This is your Christian worldview. Well, atheism is not a worldview, despite what the apologists so often say. The Ken Hams and the Lee Strobels and the William Lane Craigs and whatever. Atheism is simply the disbelief in gods. I do not believe in gods. Everything else is up for grabs. Our atheism can and often does inform how we approach the rest of the world. But atheism itself is not a worldview. It's just not. You'll find atheists across the cultural spectrum, across the political spectrum. And if you think atheists are all just a bunch of sheeple who get together to high five and pat each other on the back and walk lockstep in total agreement, get five of them in a room and ask them a question about almost anything. Okay. 
<laughs> you do not find people who are skeptical, usually skeptical about religious claims, who came to their non-belief because they analyzed it and realized it was a bunch of crap. You don't get these people in a room and have them automatically just fawn over each other. You will find people who pride themselves in critical thinking, and they will go head to head. They will argue about anything. Hell, we recently had a great podcast talking about Star Wars, The Last Jedi. You get a bunch of skeptics in the room to talk about Star Wars. They're not going to agree. So the idea that we're all having the same worldview, worshiping at the altar of atheism, is just bogus. And it's a great example of how religious people insist on talking in religious ways, using religious language, right? We have a convention at church. If we listen to a speaker who's behind a podium or on a platform, well, they're a preacher. If somebody does any sort of fundraising, for organizations, atheist organizations like American Atheists or the Secular Student Alliance or whatever. Well, that's a tithe that you're giving to the Church of Atheism. If somebody like Anthony Magna Bosco is out there doing street epistemology, trying to disabuse people of their faith, asking why they believe what they believe, getting them to think critically about what they may have previously assumed, well... In the eyes of the religious, Anthony is an atheist preacher. He's preaching the gospel, the good news of atheism. This is how religious people think. This is how they always want to try to form non-religious things into religious language. Greg said, you just have to take it on faith. Rosie said, God works in mysterious ways. Yancey said, if I'm wrong... I've lost nothing, but if you're wrong, you've lost everything. Of course, this is Pascal's wager, and it's not a statement of true belief or conviction. It's a poker bet, right? Well, you know, just in case. I mean, I don't want to go to hell, so I'll believe in God, which is weird because beliefs aren't formed like that. Like you don't choose not to believe in gravity. You don't choose not to believe that the sun won't rise tomorrow morning. Right? These beliefs are already there. It's what you declare that you believe. Will said, I've never met an atheist on their deathbed. A version of this being, there are no atheists in foxholes, which is total crap. Ed posted the answer from the religious who run out of options and run out of ideas. They say, you're so arrogant. You think you're the only one? You think that nothing created you, that nothing's bigger than you? This is the assertion that's out there. We don't declare that. Like, by saying I don't believe in God, they say that we think that we are a supreme being ourselves. That's not what we're saying. In fact, I think atheism is actually a great informer of true humility when you realize you live as a speck upon a speck in a universe that doesn't really care whether or not you exist and that your life is finite and you're not going to you know, go off to Xanadu or Nirvana or whatever you call heaven and get a mansion and jewels in your crown and constant music and pearly gates and streets of gold and, and eternal reward and all these types of things. You know, when you realize this is it and the universe is going to exist long after I'm gone and it is what it is, that is a ticket to true humility. I'm going to take a real short break. When I come back, I'm going to talk about this article that appeared in Fox News a couple of weeks ago, saying that today's atheists are bullies and that they are doing their best to intimidate the rest of America into silence. Now, you think you've heard Fox News propaganda? Brace yourselves, my friends, because I'm going to get into this series of straw men right after this. What if you could get your contact lens prescription renewed and order your contacts without ever leaving your house? Simple Contacts lets you do in minutes what used to take hours. With Simple Contacts, you can take a five-minute vision test at home using your smartphone or computer. It's carefully reviewed by a licensed ophthalmologist in your state. And then you take that renewed prescription and you order your brand of contacts, whatever brand you like. If you already have an unexpired prescription, just upload a photo or your doctor's information and then order your lenses. It's vision care for the 21st century. I took the $20 eye exam on my cell phone, of all things. I answered a few questions from the ophthalmologist and boom, I had a fresh prescription and my Bausch & Lomb contacts that I wear driving and out on the tennis court, etc. This seriously beats the actual office visit, which usually chews up my whole morning. 
And since you and I can order whatever contact lens brand we like, Simple Contacts is just a time-saving, money-saving, simple, and pretty awesome way to get our contacts. Right now, you can get $30 off your contact lenses and free shipping. Just go to simplecontacts.com slash Seth Andrews and then enter the promo code Seth Andrews. Now, this isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam, but it is a great way to update your prescription and get your new contacts easily, less expensively, and simply. $30 off your contact lenses when you go to simplecontacts.com slash Seth Andrews, promo code Seth Andrews. My wonderful patrons get a commercial-free version of this broadcast, and they get it two days early, plus a bonus broadcast every single month. If you'd like to support me on Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. You see that article in, uh, well, you may not read Fox News. I just, it was brought to my attention because it was so batshit crazy. It's an opinion piece from uh, the 20th of March, I guess by a guy named Anthony DeStefano. He'd written a book called Inside the Atheist Mind, unmasking the religion of those who say there is no God. Now, hang on. All right, you and I are on the same page. We can already smell what uh, Cybeg would call the fuckery. (laughs) But stick with me. The article was titled... Today's atheists are bullies, and they're doing their best to intimidate the rest of us into silence. And he goes into just one straw man after the other. The American atheist billboards encouraging people to skip church and enjoy the day on their own terms. This is an attack on Christianity. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation's protest about having the Reverend Billy Graham laid out in stage at the Capitol... You know, as a governmental exercise, a taxpayer-funded exercise, was inappropriate. Promotes the lie that we can't stand to hear someone wish us a Merry Christmas because our thin skins and delicate sensibilities won't allow it. you got to be shitting me. I host the Thinking Atheist website and radio podcast, and I say Merry Christmas because it's what the holiday is called. Scientist X was religious, therefore religion is validated. He drops the typical names we're used to hearing. Stalin, the atheist. Guilty of genocide. Pol Pot, the atheist. Guilty of genocide. And yes, Hitler, the atheist. Guilty of genocide. Between 1900 and 2017, approximately 150 million people killed by atheistic political regimes. Oh, it's just awful. Guy named David said he was speaking to a guy a religious man who said he refused to respond to foolish and unlearned questions because they only engender strife. I remember uh, Cy Tin Bruggenkate, the apologist, saying to Matt Dillahunty that he doesn't engage in Bible study with atheists, which is stupid. It's stupid if you believe the words of the Bible. 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone, and that includes atheists. How in the world do you convince an atheist the Bible is true if you never get into the reading of and the analysis of the Bible itself? I mean, the argument makes no sense. David posted a classic response. Well, that was all Old Testament. We're under the New Covenant. We're under the New Testament now. Of course, when you ask them to quote scriptures about their opposition to, say, homosexuality, where do they go? They go to the Old Testament. If you ask them about the Ten Commandments, you know, many of them, they have some version of the Ten Commandments posted even in their homes, certainly in their churches, the Ten Commandments. Is that Old or New Testament? Oh, wait, the Old Testament is now obsolete, so we throw out the Ten Commandments, okay? Lisa said she had heard Christians say it's true because the Bible says so. A few other classics. You just hate God. You're angry at God. 
God's ways are higher than our ways. His ways are not our ways. It's the devil whispering in your ear. It's an attack of the evil one. Don't succumb to the devil's ways. I don't trust your source. I don't trust your evidence. Oh, you were a Christian and now you're an atheist? Well, you were never a true Christian to begin with. No one who had truly accepted Jesus Christ could ever walk away from his love. How could something come from nothing? So you think we came from monkeys. And then, of course, once you try to explain things like common ancestry, they just glaze over or walk away. I'm sorry someone hurt you. Only someone who'd been genuinely hurt in their life would manifest such negativity in their heart. Which is a way of discrediting the messenger, right? Somebody out there gave you a bad impression of what Christianity is, what we are, what we do, why we do it. Someone hurt you, and now you have a bend to broken. You have a distorted view of Jesus. You're doing it wrong. You're going to need the guidance of the Holy Spirit for all of this to make sense, which makes no sense to me because, of course, you have to accept Jesus Christ and then have the Holy Spirit as a byproduct of salvation. If you need to be saved in order to understand the Bible to get saved, this makes no sense. It's become kind of a game in my own life to sort of see how long it takes for the religious person to say the word Hitler. It just happens all the time, especially with my mother and father. My mother likes to throw out Hitler. Hitler, Stalin, Hitler, Stalin, Hitler, Stalin. And of course, if you reveal to her the facts that, well, you know, actually Hitler was raised Catholic and embraced Christianity and invoked God in Mein Kampf and believed he was doing God's good work, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was a madman, but he, he was not an atheist. She won't accept even Hitler's own writings and quotations invoking the name of God. No, in her mind, he was an atheist, and atheists are evil, and that's just the way it is. And it's been going on and on and on and on and on. And our relationship's kind of been off and on over the years. Last time I saw my parents was in, was at Christmas, actually. Didn't really talk to them very much, but, you know, they were there. The house filled with people. And had a really good time. We're sitting around the dining room table enjoying our Christmas dinner, okay? And it's me and Natalie and some other members of my family. And then mom and dad are off to my left, sort of around the corner of the table. And so we're talking about, I don't know what, we're just having a good time. We were having a great Christmas evening. Talking about just dumb stuff and sharing stories and laughing and doing what families ought to do. And... Someone in my family, I don't want to name her, but she's extended family. But I guess the people on my family tree just don't talk about what I do. It must be this hush-hush thing. I cannot imagine somebody in my family who didn't know what I did for a living, which is to be an atheist activist full-time. So with the most innocent face, she, I think we, I've been talking about our Natalie and me going to Australia a few years ago and the flight back and just travel stuff. Someone had been on a cruise and, and so travel, travel, travel. And so she says to me, she says, now you travel quite a bit in your work, but I don't really know what you do. What do you do for a living? Now, I didn't look over at my mother. Natalie looked, but I did not look. And I answered it in the most diplomatic way that I could. <laughs> but I answered the question as to what I do for a living. And we sort of sprung off of, well, it began with a blog. And, you know, I'm a radio host. I've written a couple of books. And I do probably 35 speaking dates throughout the year. My desire here at Christmas isn't to make my parents uncomfortable. But this is who I am and this is what I do. It's a very simple answer to a very innocent question, okay? Well... Natalie in the car said, did you see your mother's face? No, I didn't even look. What was her expression? And I guess, Mom, she looked like Medusa. <laughs> you know, the green light in her eyes. And she, I guess she just was scowling with contempt, contempt just oozing out of her. And I can see it happening. I mean, the idea that I would be honest about what I do. 
about who I am, about what I think at a family gathering. Such a controversial thing grieves her so much. Everyone else is supposed to be able to live their faith. I'm supposed to shut my mouth. And so I told Natalie, all right, well, I'm going to get a text. It's probably going to be in the next couple of days, but I'm going to get a text from mom. You just wait. And so two days later, I received this, and I'll just read it to you. My mother said, to my wonderful son, whom I love much, I see your desire to lead other family members down your path of destruction. Do not do it. When Jesus comes to you, do not turn him away. You do not now realize it, but you are being called a fool. Wake up before you and your cohorts become ashes under the feet of those who did not turn Jesus away. I love you very much. Do not try to turn family down the path of destruction. I responded simply that I just answered the question. I wasn't evangelizing atheism at the table. I just answered the question as to what I do for a living. And I was pretty damn diplomatic about it. And she sent a few more volleys. And I finally just thought, what am I doing? And so I just blocked her. I blocked my mother. So now both parents are blocked on my cell phone. If there is an emergency, they can dial Natalie or something. They can find me. But they're not able to contact me directly. They have forfeited the right to contact me directly. And that's just a hard stand that I've taken in my own life. Uh, Natalie asked me what that felt like. What's it feel like to block your own parents? And I said, honestly, after all this time, I feel like I'm blocking spam. Which is just sad. I don't feel any grief. I don't feel any heartache. I don't feel a sense of loss. I feel like I just blocked a spammer. But I found the text itself very interesting. I mean, if you dissect it, you see language that is curiously like that of an abuser. Now, I'm not saying that mom is abusive. Okay, mom is what I call a victim of bad ideas. Mom and dad both. They are sort of indoctrinated with bad ideas. And they're doing what they do because they genuinely do fear hell. But they are also, whether they mean to or not, acting and speaking in some ways like an abuser, right? Did you listen to the language in the text? Love, destruction, love, you're a fool, love, you will be ashes under the feet of those who don't believe. Love, destruction, love, destruction, love, destruction. And mom is very clear in all the text that she sends that talks about, you know, the rejection of God and the consequences and how I'm, I mean, I'm crazy and I've done all these other things. I'm an embarrassment to the family. She always makes sure that several times in that message, it says, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I don't doubt that her love, as broken as it is, as distorted by religion as it is, is sincere. But this is very much the language of an abuser, isn't it? I love you, you're going to burn. I love you, you will be damned. I love you, but you're foolish and shameful and out of your mind. I think it's an interesting case study in indoctrination, inherited belief systems, wild insecurity about a supposedly demonstrable truth, and the perversion of love-based language to try to sort of threaten other people into submission. It's really a threat. You will be ashes under the feet of those who did not reject Jesus. I'm amazed at the wild insecurity on display. I would think if you were a person of real conviction— that you would be eager for someone to say at the table, well, I don't believe it, and here's why. Because it would give you an opportunity to be able to prove your case. If the case for Christ, as Lee Strobel has framed it, is so demonstrable, so undeniable, why in the world would somebody be threatened by non-belief in it? I also think that this particular text is a great refutation to the notion, to the claims that Christianity is about love. I mean, Christianity loves its happy, clappy verses. Talk about turning the other cheek and loving your enemy and love your neighbor as yourself and all those things. Feeding the poor and charity. I mean, you can look in the Bible and find laudable, wonderful verses. But at its core, all of this is propped up on a threat. It's propped up on the threat that if you don't comply God is going to cook you forever. 
He will destroy you in flesh and in spirit, which I'm not sure I fully understand. Because if you are spirit, how do you burn in hell? Is there flesh and then it's burned and then regenerated and then burned again? Or is your spirit somehow writhing in torment in physical flames? There's a lot about hell that doesn't make any sense. But it's it's a threat. Christianity is a fear cult that tells people, accept or you're going to pay and you'll pay dearly. You say that to any of these Christians who are tossing out the platitudes. God is love. You may not believe in him, but he believes in you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And if you bring up the fact that the reason we would perish is because Jesus would himself perish us, they just blink and say, God is love. God is love. They become my Father. The Bible is true. The Bible is good. The Bible is perfect. The Bible is true. The Bible is good. The Bible is perfect. Quick footnote to that story, if I may, about my parents. And the only reason I'm sharing this very personal stuff is, one, I don't know really who else to tell. And two, after 10 years of crossed boundaries, I have decided that I'm perfectly fine with making my mom and dad a case study in how religion damages families, you know? I'm not trying to shame anybody, but I think, quite frankly, if you're going to conduct yourself in this way, I'm going to use you as an object lesson (laughs) on the radio and elsewhere. So my folks are blocked on my phone. They can't access me. They can't cross boundaries with me in this way anymore. I've drawn that hard line. So my wife, Natalie, gets a text from mom out of the blue, and it says, Hi, Natalie. How would you like to come to church with us? Oh, it seems so innocuous on the surface. But knowing the history, knowing the people, I am absolutely convinced this is a chess move and really a violation of boundaries, right? You can't get into my life, go after my spouse. Well, Natalie's her own person. I mean, she can decide for herself what she wants to do. And she's not having any of this. You know, she's not even an atheist, but she's not going to church with my mom. She can see the train coming. She has no desire. She told me, I'd rather spend the day with you anyway. Let's go hang out. You know, she doesn't want to go to church. She's not interested. But it provides yet another example of how dysfunctional religion makes many families and how bizarre and inappropriate behavior is so often justified in the name of God. It's just tragic all the way around. It's one of the reasons I do what I do, because I'd like fewer people to have to navigate through all this weirdness and insanity in their own lives. I guess that'll do it for the broadcast today. Kind of short and sweet, kind of ranty today, I guess. I will be back next Tuesday with the broadcast, which was recorded at the American Atheist National Convention It's my 50th birthday broadcast. The birthday's coming up. I'm enjoying the last few days of being 49. And because I want to share my birthday and this special occasion with the people I care about and the people who have my back and get me and whose company I enjoy, well, that would be mostly atheists. And uh, so anyway, I had a great time out there. That broadcast is going to release next Tuesday, and that's going to be a lot of fun. Later on in the month of April, I finally have Dr. Abby Hafer joining me to talk about the not-so-intelligent designer. Uh, We got delayed on this one because she's just been so busy. But uh, she's got a great book that talks about these really crappy examples of design. You know, people are like, oh, you just look at us and know that there was an intelligence behind how everything is made, especially the human machine. And Dr. Hafer goes through and she's like, no, actually, this sucks and this is crap and this is inefficient and this doesn't work. She's got just some good stuff she's going to share with us. That's coming up a little later on here in the month of April. I will be honored to have her on the show. I hope your week is wonderful, my friends. I'll see you back here next time. Take care. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com